Thank you, Neil, and good afternoon, everyone. And if I can introduce our two panel members. So we have, first of all, um, Dr. Natalie Hudson, who's a senior researcher fellow working at the Smurfit Institute of uh, Genetics in Trinity. And um, Natalie has worked in the area of ophthalmology for almost 16 years, if I've calculated that correctly. Oh, no. <laughs> and, yeah. and we also have Dr. Nicholas Pontkus, who's a group leader at University College London, um, who's working on identifying rare disease genetic mutations and mechanisms. And he's also a part-time senior data scientist at Moorfield Eye Hospital, analyzing health data to improve care. So if I can start with Natalie. Um, Natalie, you started your research career in ophthalmology starting with your PhD project. What interests you in becoming involved in the field? Okay, so I work in the genetics department, but I'm not a geneticist. I'm a cell biologist. Um, so when I was in uni um, in Sussex, uh, I did a course called molecular medicine. And during those years, I actually learned a lot from lecturers that was just how your cells function. And I got interested in this because we got taught, you know, if something goes wrong in your cell, it can either be a really good thing or a really bad thing. And I think that was what interested me because I'm going to kind of say it's like Chinese whispers. If you start a sentence and it's the cat on the rat, on, on the cat on the mat, and you go down the line, cells that form our blood vessels and um, how they change during the day and if they change at night. And I'm actually now looking at this in the context of age-related macular degeneration and particularly dry AMD, for which there is no therapy. So our understanding of what's happening in the blood vessels might help us to discover some new therapeutic targets, especially because we think this is happening far earlier than when you see changes in the cells that die in that condition. So, yeah. And if I can move to Nicholas, um, you've had a much different career um, track in comparison to, um, to Natalie. You started off as a computer scientist, so how did you end up in ophthalmology? Uh, good question. Uh, so, uh, yes, I did start with computer science, and then I you know, I, I enjoyed pro computer programming, really. That's what got me into. And I should say, actually, probably video games got me into computers to start with. Uh, and then um, doing computer programming, I started thinking about, you know, I could just program for fun, or I could try and do something useful and, and beneficial. And that got me thinking about how can I apply my skill to, uh, to help people. Um, and so at the time, uh, I just looked around and I found that a good application of computers in medical research was called bioinformatics, which is the analysis of biological data. So I got into that uh, and, and, did a, and did some uh, training in that. And then, okay, I'm not going to say the whole thing because it's going to take ages, but eventually I ended up working on genetics data in the context of ophthalmology. I was also working on genetics data in other diseases, but what really got me interested in, in ophthalmology uh, was, uh, I should say first, the people I was working with were really nice, uh, and they really appreciated uh, the, 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 the help I was bringing to the team. And then also the fact that it's very translational, so you can see the benefits of your work quite quickly, which in my area is not always uh, the case. And also, I should add, uh, I, because I like working with data, the fact that we had access to a lot of ret retinal scans uh, and that we could match, we could link and match the retinal scans to the genetics data and basically correlate these data sets to try and diagnose a disease more effectively. That was something that was very interesting to me as a, as a data scientist. Thank you. So, um, Natalie, you work as a lab bench researcher in our, you know, the traditional, um, the wet lab, we, you know, we all see the images in you know, the test tubes and whatnot, and microscopes, um, whereas Nicholas, your research is carried out in a dry lab, so you're using you know, computers and artificial intelligence um, to carry out your research. Could you both tell us, the audience, a little, a little bit about what that entails, like what is your day-to-day -day work, you know, what, what's, what's your average day? Okay. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I guess what you see on TV isn't always true. Um, yes, I do move a clear liquid from one tube to another often. They're not blue or pink, but that's just for, like, you know, TV, it looks a bit fancier. Um, I'll be honest, I do work a lot with animal models, and particularly mice, so apologies if you're not a big fan of that. Um, but I do a lot of taking pictures of the mice's, mouse's, mice, <laughs> mice eyes, 
Um, so we often do a lot of things called a fluorescein angiography. So some of you might have had this when you go to an eye doctor. It's like you have injected a fluorescent dye, makes your blood vessels appear um, green. And we can take pictures of these and we can just see how leaky these blood vessels are. And we also can do a lot of imaging called optical coherence tomography or OCT images. And again, this might be something you've had done at the eye doctors. And this shows us how the back of the retina, so all the different layers that make up your vision, how they look in these mice models. And we can manipulate these models to look at um, changing levels of um, a protein that we find we've found of interest in our models that could influence um, these barrier properties that your blood vessels have. We also do look at a downer microscope often, um, and we also have cell models that we look at. You know, we also I do also sit at a computer analyzing data, not to the extreme that Nicholas does. Um, sometimes you'll probably see some researchers with their heads in their hands kind of crying because they can't figure out how something works. Um, but really, a lot of what you might have done at an eye doctors, we can do with um, the mice, and hopefully this helps to inform us using these mice models what could later then be done in human studies. And I would like to say, I also have, um, we also do some clinical research with patients that do have been diagnosed with AMD, um, and so like we are now, I'm also now taking pictures of humans, so it's quite nice to uh, have the mix, in my opinion. <laughs> Nicholas, you would come. So, uh, I'm, I'm currently managing a team, so a lot of what I do is online meetings. But uh, what, what the purpose of these online meetings, which is more interesting to you, is um, trying to, well, obviously, do make everyone get everyone to work on, on, the, on the projects and identifying new sort of data sets and ideas uh, that we can work on. Um, so. Um, Avril was talking about the importance of, of healthcare data. Uh, so we can only work on the problems uh, for, from a computer scientist, data scientist perspective, if the data is there. Uh, there's a lot of interesting problems we would like to work on, but we don't always have access to the to the data. Um, so, uh, as I said, I'm a bit more hands off now when it comes to the day to day uh, work, but I still do a lot of computer programming. So I spend most of my day at, at the computer. Um, and I try and uh, analyze, um, as I said, my team does a lot of the, uh, of the hands-on work now, but I still analyze some data uh, occasionally, do some statistics, try and find trends in the data, and try and, and as I said, yeah, try and fig figure out what, what are the next sort of problems we should work on by talking to doctors and seeing how we can work together to, to help, uh, so I can help them um, solve these problems. What research publication are you most proud of? Or oh, me first. Um, <laughs> you can go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go. Uh, yeah, it's 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 a difficult <laughs> question. <laughs> um, so a lot of the work I've done. It's been helping other people. Uh, so I don't know if I can claim really like ownership. So, but I, I'm very happy that I've been able to help uh, a lot of research projects move forward. Um, I think recently one nice thing we did is we built a, a um, so this is not retinal, this is uh, cornea. So I work with many uh, eye conditions. So this is a condition called keratoconus. Uh, so we built like a calculator, uh, which is, um, if you pre at presentation, you, you measure your um, cornea parameters, and you enter them, and then it gives you a um, prediction of when are you likely to need uh, a treatment called cornea um, collagen cross-linking, which is a treatment for keratoconus. So that, that's quite nice. Uh, and more, yeah, more recently, what I presented yesterday, uh, my my IT gene. This is a project I think I can claim a bit more <laughs> ownership of because I really have managed to get the funding and have been driving the project, which is the ITGene uh, project, which is um, developing an AI system that if you give it retinal scans, it can uh, identify the gene that is likely to be causing the inherited retinal disease. So that's, I think, going to be a very useful AI tool, at least I hope, 
Uh, we're still developing it. We've got two more years of funding by the uh, National Institute of Health Research in the UK to work on that. So I would say that's probably what I'm hopefully going to be the most proud of. Yeah. Okay. For me, I think, I guess, finding that um, blood vessels in your retina actually might be involved in AMD and that it might be happening a lot earlier than other mechanisms that have been found for um, causing AMD. And then that this has kind of led to us introducing a clinical research aspect to our work where we're actually meeting people um, that have kindly volunteered their time to come into the clinics in the morning and the evening to have fluorescenes, both those that have no known ocular phenotype, but all those that have um, the early stages of AMD. And it's kind of a real privilege to actually be able to like work with these people and in like get to know them and I guess not scare them off to come back in for their second appointment. Um, and I find it really like humbling to like actually meet people like you guys um, because obviously this is why it gives me I guess more of like a push up the backside if I should say <laughs> um, to actually like do the research more. So I think that's my kind of thing. I suppose that would lead into one of my next questions is like, you know, how do patients and patient care influence and inform your research? Uh, yeah, so obviously because of the clinical research, without people like you guys, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, I will honestly say sometimes at seven o'clock in the morning on a winter's day when I'm going to the clinic and it's lashing down with rain, I really don't want to be going. And then you get there and you meet someone that has offered to give their time. Um, you have a chat with them, you get to know them, and you come out feeling like a lot more positive, a lot more better about what you're doing, and you go back to the lab with more of a kick in your step and a bit more joy. Um, yeah, like, that's really important, but also knowing and talking to them, knowing kind of, you know, as Ava was saying, different conditions, people's ideas and perspectives of what they want to have in their treatment is really important. So, like, I, as a scientist, think... I want to cure the condition, right? That's the ultimate goal. But for someone, it might just be that they want to keep their, the, the vision that they have now for as long as they possibly can. So understanding what the patient or this group of people want actually is really informative for us because you know, you know it might not be the same idea as to what I think or like other people in the lab think. So. I think it's really important that we listen to you guys to inform what we do. Do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, yeah, so that, that was a really good ans answer, and I think um, it covered the, also what I was going to say. Um, I should. I wanted to add one thing. It, to, for me, a lot of my work with patients is through doctors. So I ask doctors what do they need, and then they tell me what they need for their work, which is a, a lot of times is aligned with what the patients need. But I'd be quite interested in working more maybe with patients and uh, people affected with inherited retinal diseases and seeing if there's any technology, maybe things we haven't even thought of yet that we could help. I think particularly in the assistive technology space. So yes, we're trying to cure, as you were saying, but sometimes just being able to live better with your condition is, is more important and more, well, in the short term is definitely more important because all these therapies that are being developed are all going to take some time, uh, a, a lot of them. So, um, yeah, so I think that's what I wanted to say. Probably there's other things, but I can't, I can't think of that. <laughs> and just to lead on as well, yeah. Yeah, um, onto another question, um, and how important do you feel is the role of, of organisations such as Fighting Blindness in driving patient-focused research? Yeah. Um, so I think a day like this is really important. I think I can't even think of another charity or organization that has a scientific meeting on Monday and the next day has a public engagement day and that they do this annually. I think it's pretty amazing. I think the fact that Fight and Blindness and charities like this um, give you guys an opportunity to ask questions, to, I want to say specialists, but I don't really want to call myself a specialist, or, um, but you know, like clinicians and scientists, um, like giving you guys a voice I think is really as your, like your, your statement is, it's like to empower people. So I think this is really key because there's a lot of, I guess, charities. I mean, I can't say for all, but I don't know of any charities that actively 
do events like this and run events throughout the year to help their group of people that they want to help. Or, Natalie, you might want to comment as well too on, like, on how important charities like Fighting Blindness are in terms of funding your research. Yeah, so yeah. Fighting Blindness have uh, recently given some money to the lab, so we're now not just looking at AMD, but we've got, so we also have um, work that we're hoping to start now that are on inherited retinal degenerations. So um, obviously every bit of funding that we can get to look into different um, like diseases of the eye can only be beneficial, right? So the more we know, the more we can find out, the more we can develop new therapies, the more we can hopefully help those that have vision loss. Nicholas, do you mind please? Yeah, I've been very impressed uh, with how engaged buying blindness is. Um, so I was invited to present, and then on the back of that, I was also invited to, uh, thanks to Don, your, I think it's your communications uh, yeah. a media uh, officer, he, uh, I was invited to talk uh, to a radio show. Um, you might have heard me, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Hopefully it made sense what I said. Um, and yeah, just being able to the, promote our, our research and to the widest audience, so people are aware of what we're working on and and what why we're working on it, uh, which is you know the, the people here why why we're working on these things. Um, so yeah, it's just I think it's really important to raise awareness um, because sight loss is often overlooked, and even in the I should say in the research research space. It's very difficult to get funding for sight, for, for sight loss. Uh, people always think that, okay, uh, conditions that kill you immediately are more important uh, in terms of the funders. And so we always prioritize um, you know, cancer, um, cardiovascular. I mean, of course, these are important conditions, but we should all not be neglecting uh, sight loss as a, as a really important condition. So I think the work that Fighting Blindness is, uh, is doing and all the eye charities and, and, and also Retina International to help change the policy, as we heard earlier, is, is, is really, really important to fund our research so we can continue working on this. Um, so one last question from me before I open up to the floor. So um, where do you both see the field of vision loss research going in the next five years? What do you think are like the key questions that need to be answered? I mean, I guess everyone in the audience is hoping, or I, you know, that there is like more drugs and therapies and treatments out there that have been approved, or at least in the stages of clinical trials where they're kind of coming to the end that they get, they will be approved. I guess, um, for also having more drugs that are in preclinical trial, in trial, like you know, phase one, phase two, or just like knowing as much as we can as quickly as we can for all the different conditions, which is obviously a massive task, but there are a number of scientists in the world that are doing this, so hopefully there's a lot more collaborations as well between scientists in different labs and universities that are working on similar things. Obviously, ultimately, cures is what I'd say in five years, but I don't know if that will be the situation, but hopefully we're nearer than further away. I think if we can, um, so from my perspective, technology, if we can use technology to improve the speed at which we are doing these trials and, and the success rate of these trials, um, then that, that's going to be of, of major benefit. So in the next five years, I'm hoping obviously we get more treatments approved, uh, that we get new um, technologies to help people uh, better cope on a day-to-day -day life and we get better sort of systems for uh, identifying the diseases early so we have a better opportunity, more opportunities for, for successful treatment. Can I open it up to the floor if there's any questions? Do you want to raise your hand? So I think first of all Avril and then the gentleman at the back. Thank you very much. That's, that was great um, to hear um, Avril Daly from, from Retin International. I, I'm going to bring up a kind of a tricky subject, but I'm really interested because you can see from the work that you're doing um, how much potential there is. And, you know, we're very familiar with the work that's happening in the UK, Moorfields, Leeds, you know, Manchester and beyond. 
I have to say that, you know, it was fantastic five years ago when we established our European reference networks for rare eye disease, and we were able to have the, the, the knowledge and the expertise uh, of the UK involved in that network. And now we know that that is not possible any longer because of the situation with the B word, which I won't, I won't you know, I won't bring up. But I think it's very important to, to say that, you know, you know, I would, are you in a situation and your colleagues now challenged by Brexit? Because my understanding is that because you're, you're working internally you know, to get a bite of the cherry. Where does does the retina sit in that? And it, are there ways that we, as a community, can work together to to support the, the incredible work that's being done there to ensure that it's not um, lost and that it's not excluded from the incredible work of your peers at a European level? You know, where you would have a tradition of working with. I I think it's 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 really critical um, that you are your community is involved. So I, I just wondered what you thought of that. I, you know, it's a, it's a difficult one to bring up, but it's very practical and, you know, we were concerned as patients. Yeah, I think, I think we're all concerned about <laughs> Brexit. Uh, you can't see, but I'm wearing my EU socks. But anyway, not, not, <laughs> not, not to make... <laughs> I'm just <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I'm turning this into a political thing. But anyway, um, <laughs> it was a kind of a politically charged question. Uh, but, but yeah, no, so obviously we want to be beyond uh, politics uh, in, in science. And um, I don't, yeah, on, we are not able to get funding from Horizon 2020. I've been kicked, not I, we've been kicked out of the European Reference Network. Um, but we're hoping, you know, slowly to get back in with our European partners. And when we're dealing with rare diseases, we need to be global. Uh, we need to be working globally. So um, what Foundation Fine Blindness is doing, for example, with their registry, and uh, that, um, so, sorry, uh, somebody mentioned, well, I Ireland is part of, yeah, of course, of the <laughs> ERNI, so you've got all your data sets that you can share uh, with also Foundation Fine Blindness and so on. And, but yeah, uh, with my work, the ITGene work, uh, we, we've got um, partners in Germany and in Japan on the grant. So it, it's possible to still do science, you know, we um, to continue data sharing and do science. Um, it's just a bit trickier now with the uh, legislation and so on. Um, but yeah, we, we're not, going to let Brexit stop us. <laughs> There's a question from the gentleman at the back. Uh, is it, okay, uh, three, 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 three questions. Firstly, um, <clears throat> how many, so far, how many genes are there in the retina and how come you seem to be still discovering more? That's the first question. Second question, You've been talking a lot about inherited diseases of the retina. In my case, as far as I know, I, it's not an inherited genetic disease of the retina. It's, it just arrived with me, which I think is a mutation or something. Uh, so I've been a little bit thrown by the, the, the constant reference to fighting blindness being concerned with inherited uh, retina conditions. And my third question is a very practical one. I like to watch uh, soccer matches on the television. Uh, and in the last few years, my central vision, the limited central vision I have has deteriorated to the point where when I look at the TV, I can see the players running around, but I can never see the ball. Now, what I would love is if there was some technology that could somehow illuminate the ball Without, without distracting everybody else and would make it possible for me not to look at football as, you know, 22 players running madly around the pitch after something that cannot be seen, but something that can be seen. I don't imagine it should be hugely problematic. I'm just amazed that it hasn't happened so far. Those are my three questions. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, okay, first question, genes, gene discovery. Um, yeah, so why are we discovering more and more genes, I guess? Um, we are discovering rarer and rarer ones, basically. So 
we found uh, Rando, I probably is not here anymore, uh, uh, Rando Alec Metz, uh, who is a famous scientist, to have been the first to discover ABCA4 uh, in 1997, which is the most common cause of inherited blindness. And what we see is that that's just a, it's the most common cause. Uh, so it was the I would say it's the, it was the easiest one to, found, to find first. What we're finding now are rare and rare ones. Um, so the, um, I'm not a biologist, but uh, uh, um, um, uh, Natalie, sorry. Uh, we'll, uh, quite bad with names. Uh, uh, Natalie will um, explain a bit more maybe what happens at the level of the retina and why there's so oh. many genes involved, maybe. No, I don't know. I can try. I can try. But yeah, it's a, there's, there's a lot of, of, of genes basically involved in, in, in a healthy retina. So I think, I don't know, at some point it's going to, with, well, if you look at the rate of discovery, we're discovering less and less, and it's getting harder to discover them. So we are going to reach saturation at some point. There's 25,000 genes, I think, in the, uh, roughly in the, in the human um, genome. So you know, it's not all 25,000 are going to be involved, but um, we'll you know, maybe go. I, I, somebody here is probably a better place to tell me how many, to make an educated guess about how many more genes there are to discover. But I would say maybe a hundred more or something, I don't know. Uh, your, sec your second question was how come you, um, it's an inherited, yeah exactly, an inherited condition, but you're the first in your family to have it, so it's p potentially a re recessive maybe, or it's de novo. Uh, what that means, so recessive means that uh, basically your parents are carriers, both of your parents would be carriers uh, of a genetic um, defect, um, but um, only when they, um, they by the genetic defect by itself does not cause the disease, but when you have both of the genetic defects um, inherited from both parents, then you have the condition. So that's potentially what the, uh, might be the case. Or uh, what's called de novo is basically a spontaneous mutation that happens in an individual uh, during... Um, during development, I guess during uh, early, even before um, you're born, I think, uh, which can be also be the case. But I'm not sure exactly what your your, your condition might be. Um, so we, we can talk about it later if you want. And there's many scientists here that can give you a more educated answer. Um, and thirdly, football <laughs> and tracking the, the football. Yeah, so th this is why we're talking about assistive technologies. And I think... You know, we should, and fighting blindness are, you know, in, interested in, in assistive technologies, not only in the curing, but also making everyone's, uh, making everyone's life basically better. So, yeah, why not have a, a technology that makes the ball more apparent or maybe, you know, screen reading or so something that can make it more um, enjoyable to watch a football game? Uh, yeah, so I'm sure that can be done. Somebody can develop some software maybe to do that. Yeah. Um, I think also that we're probably still finding genes and things involved because um, the science, uh, like re ways that we can do research is actually evolving still. So there's new technologies that are for, like constantly being developed that weren't available back at the beginning and that these are like much more sensitive. We can look really in depth at like, you know, the genomes and like looking at single cells and that kind of thing. So. Science is always progressing. It just might seem a little bit slow, but we are trying. And so, like every little new technology that gets developed and tech discovered, we can then imply that and introduce that into the research that we're doing. So I think that is, I guess, adding more genes that people didn't know about. But as you know, the more we know, the better understanding we can get. So, yeah. So I think unfortunately we've run out of time. So or one or one more question. Sorry, one more one more question. I, forgive me if I talk again about AMD, but that's my speciality. <laughs> um, so 90% of people who are blind are suffering from wet AMD. I read that here. Um, and yet I feel, I personally feel there's very little out there about it. Um, I was delighted to hear you talking about it, Natalie. Yeah. I know I got onto fighting blindness about two years ago to see if there were any clinical trials in Ireland on wet AMD, and there weren't. And is that still the case today, that there are no clinical trials? 
Um, I'm not a dentist. Is there? I don't know. I'm not, so I, if I'm not an ophthalmologist, so it might be best that you speak to your ophthalmologist who could be able to tell you a bit more about that. I don't want to give you the wrong information. Um, I know, obviously, a lot of the treatment for uh, wet AMD is the anti-VEGF, so the injections into the eye. Um, but yeah, I think it's probably best to talk to your ophthalmologist because they'll probably know a little bit more about clinical trials that are underway or if you're sort of will give you, be able to give you more advice onto that. And if you're kind of in, I guess clinical trials also have eligibility and that kind of thing. So so does that mean your research has not led to clinical trials? No, so, so mine is like basic clinical research. So I'm not at clinical trials. We're just uh, all... In our study, all we have is people come in with kind of the early stages of AMD to take pictures of their retina. So mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure what I was seeing in a mouse is actually true in a human because, I mean, I don't need to cure blindness. I'm, I'm, I'm creating the mouse to be blind and then trying to cure it. Whereas, like, obviously, I need to make sure that what I'm seeing in the mouse is true in a human. So, you know, that's where the basic clinical research we're doing is coming in just to prove, like, verify that I'm not wasting my time with the mouse when it's not going to even be relevant for yourself. Yeah. So thank you very much. Oh, Appreciate welcome. that. Hi there. Oh. Um, my name is Emma Dagnan. and I'm an ophthalmologist in the Eye and Ear Hospital. And I can reassure you that there's lots of people very interested in AMD in Ireland, including myself. Uh, currently, to my knowledge, there's one active clinical trial for wet AMD. The sponsor is a drug company called Roche. It's a port delivery system whereby traditionally you have to have frequent injections and the port delivery system is a surgically implanted little implant, yeah, and you can put the drug Lucentis or whatever it may be into the port delivery system and it can be done six monthly. So there is at least, and the, the two clinical centers for that one are the Einer Hospital and the Matter Hospital. So at least one active clinical trial and there have been many in the past. So don't worry, lots of people are extremely interested in, in AMD. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> uh, thank you both. I didn't know about this until last night. I'm fascinated by it. I missed the earlier part, so forgive me if I'm repeating a question that's already been asked. Um, I detached a retina at age 17 and another, another one at 42, but it was only after the first detachment that I, I heard, I realized an aunt of mine had detached a retina a num number of years before, and then the uh, maternal grandfather's brother had been completely blind. So I'm convinced it's inherited, but I'm the father of five adult children, and my concern and my question to you is, have we reached the stage that if they were tested, you can A, foretell the, the likelihood of a child, an adult child, with my background, detaching a retina or retinas, and secondly, if it was discovered, is there any preemptive action that can be taken? Could we ask Dr. Dagnan yeah. to take that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your question. That's a very interesting one. And I have had several similar questions in my clinic, which is a genetics clinic in the Einer Hospital. And certainly, if you would ask your GP to refer you, we'd be happy to see you. And the answer to your question is, um, there are certain inherited conditions that predispose patients to um, retinal detachment. Now, unlike, say, the inherited retinal degenerations, where if we did, we looked at a number of genes, we may find that you know about 70% of them will find a, an answer. Um, it would be quite a good bit lower for retinal detachments. But if you have a very strong family history like that, I think it's certainly worth exploring. And as to your later question about, you know, is there a possibility to prevent future retinal detachment, um, it would be more of a true retinal surgeon that would answer that. But they can assess the retina. And sometimes in people who are predisposed to retinal detachment, there are areas of the retina they're looking basically a bit ropey before the retina detaches. Uh, some areas that may be called lattice degeneration or something like that. And sometimes in specific cases, they do preventative laser. So it's certainly something that is sometimes done. Um, if I can thank our um, two panel members, um, Dr. Natalie Hudson and Dr. Nicholas Ponticus. Um, and thank you for your questions as well.